CBLT Channel 5 in Toronto Cable 6. We'll get to that in a minute. Right now, here's music. CFGM, you're in tune with the Bob McEnroy Show. Well, it's 816 already. Matter of fact, the boss always wanted to think that we were here practicing since about 3.30, doing dry runs, you know? We've got time for just a, a little bit of something that's a favorite of ours here in the morning. We even like to sign off on it, so we're going. These men are very hard at work, and had it not been for the intervention of the fickle finger of fate, we might have been talking to tonight, today, uh, a couple of doctors, a member of the clergy, a gentleman farmer, and a professional athlete. But as it is, we would like you now to meet Toronto's radio morning men. From CFRB, Wally Crowder. From CBL, Harry Brown. From CFGM, Bob McAdory. Jay Nelson from CHUM. And Keith Rich from CKUI. <laughs> rather interested in knowing, Wally, what went wrong in your career. Well, you were uh, interested in being a professional athlete. Yeah, well, as a kid, I guess everybody has the idea. I think uh, Jungle Jay said he wanted to be a, a fireman or something at one no, point. No, that, that was Keith. I'm, oh, Keith, I'm sorry. <laughs> and he is a fireman. <laughs> yeah, but uh, I guess as a kid, you know, I used to watch football and play hockey, and uh, I thought that that was a pretty glamorous kind of life, to be a professional athlete, travel around, have all the chickies chasing you and everything. And... Uh, uh, what changed my mind was I had no talent. It's about as simple as that. <laughs> and there are a lot of guys that say the same thing. Ask Nelson for instance. <laughs> I, I didn't even jump for that one, no, sir. But you still find an outlet for this now. Yeah. You're kind of an amateur, right? Yeah, suppose, well, I, I, I play a lot of golf. Uh, no sometimes kidding. Good, sometimes, well, sometimes, <laughs> sometimes bad. But I, I find that, uh, that I mix a lot with uh, the guys. For instance, you know, our hours are a little different. And, uh, mm -hmm. Uh, play golf with the hockey players and with the football players and the guys who come to town, professional athletes, and uh, I like that world that they travel in. Because I'm thinking when, when all of us began, there was really no formal course in broadcasting. Now That's all right. the community colleges are turning people out specifically for this purpose, mm -hmm. and it seems to me that our age group kind of just stumbled into this almost by, by default, I suppose, eh? What happened to the medical career? Well, when you talk about when we all started, there were no schools. Yeah. I'm much younger than the rest of you guys, so oh, yeah, very well. <laughs> there were uh, courses available. No, I I, uh, I wanted to be a doctor, but in 1942 they were building an army camp fairly close to where I live in St. John's, Newfoundland, and I got a chance to be a Gunga Din. You know what's a Gunga Din? Two pails of water and mm -hmm. and, um, and a bed pan. Uh, something like that. Yeah. Yeah. And when uh, time came to go back to school in September, I had these incredible calluses on my hand, literally an inch and a half thick, and and I th thought I'm never going to work again as long as I live. And, and this is the only way I could... Uh, so I could you get into the broadcast. <laughs> <laughs> a lot of people think that. Well, I was Bob, a navigator for a while in the Air Force, which... Yes, sir. You were going there. to uh, show people the, the right way, I understand. Yeah, well, I had ideas about the priesthood, yes, when I was, uh, I guess, into my teens, actually. Then they told me the part about celibacy and uh, that... Shut you right up. Yeah, off. yeah. Turned and you moved to the other extreme, then. <laughs> <laughs> Jay? Uh, I don't know. I guess uh, at a young age, I want to be a... A doctor, and then I uh, want to do a Broadway show, and then uh, I want to fly an airplane, so I flew an airplane, and then uh, I was doing the announcing for the high school band at halftime at the football games, and uh, somebody said, there's a new radio station in town, you should try it, and I went down there, and I listened to the guy who did the, sh the show at night, and I went down, and I said, the guy at night is terrible, I can do a much better job. I had no radio experience, 16 years old, had the school sweater on, the books under mm -hmm. the arm. But this fellow, I walked right past the receptionist, receptionist at the station, and he said, well, if you think you can do a better job, why don't you be here tonight at 9.30 meet the, the Sandman, was his name. Mm -hmm. He said, meet the guy. And I'm going out, and I see on the door, general manager and president. Well, it didn't matter to me. I, I told him. So I was there that night. And uh, I'm looking around, and this guy who I'd talked to that day is there, and I said, uh, well, okay, where's the Sandman? I want to tell him to his face just how bad he is. He says, I'm the Sandman. <laughs> so you go on the air in a half an hour, go in the music library and pick your music. Pick, what do you mean pick music? You know, I could just yeah. about handle picking my nose, never mind music. <laughs> so I went in there. I went in there and pulled these albums out and come in, and he said, you sit in that studio, I'll run the board, the control board for you. So I sat there and played a McGuire Sisters record or something, and I said, that's the McGuire Sisters. 
you know, and just Next. old stage fright, you know. But I got the job. I was on the air for a half an hour. I got the job, and it paid 30 bucks a week, and the checks bounced. <laughs> I did. I, I did a remote from a bar, and we had no, we had to do a remote. I, we, still do it. No, we, we did a remote from a bar. You got you got two fifty for a half hour show. I, I still remember the group's name called the Senators, a country and western band. And in order for Don McLaughlin, the owner of the, the I forget the name of the the Domino Bar and Grill, mm -hmm. Penn Avenue, Penn Penn Avenue and Spruce Street in Scranton, Pennsylvania, and I think it's still there. And I think the band is still there, <laughs> riveted to the spot, because they put a lot of booze away. Anyway, we did the, uh, the remote, but to cash the check, they'd make you carry booze up from the cellar. But you persevered. No, I'm still working there. That's where I work oh, on weekends. Oh, yeah, sure. <laughs> Two fifty a night. Are you still kidding? got time? Sure. <laughs> oh, okay, we got a split <laughs> second here. He asked, he asked, he asked the question. <laughs> You're the one that, that really is just about doing what you kind of set out to do. Yeah, the Army camp bit is surprising because it was repeated in CHOV in Pembroke uh, during the war in 1942. Gordy Archibald started a station there, and Dad was posted in, in the, to Petawawa camp mm -hmm. when I was a 17-year-old, 16-year-old, I guess, and. And there was nobody to run the radio station. Everybody was in the army, so they picked a bunch of high school kids. One number one did it, and uh, has been doing it ever since. But just before we go any further, because yeah. it's going to be one upsmanship, uh, or <laughs> and I may never get the chance again. <laughs> the, the lady who does the makeup, very charming individual, very knowledgeable, very wise. Yes, listens to CKY in the morning. All right, we're going to go with uh, Moriat, right? Right? You paying attention in there? She's great. She's beautiful, and she's Peggy. Peggy Lee, it's three minutes to 10 o'clock. we got time for just a, a little bit of something that's a favorite of ours here in the morning. We even like to sign off on it, so we're going to this morning. Paul Moriat's called Emmett, the man of my life. Here it is. Thank you, sir. That was well done for you. Uh, so we'll just sign it off after. Just going to take us. You did your audition? One on the break. One on the break? 60? 30. 30, okay. Pay attention. <laughs> you didn't pay attention. I've been up for five hours. Um, Burton and Templeton, ready to go, and all that jazz. Okay. Okay, it's coming up. I think it's a real production this morning, right? It's going to end on time? Okay, just wait a little break and we'll take it. Come on up, let's go. And that's it, neighbors. It's a minute and a half to 10 o'clock. That does it for all the morning gang here at CKY. Hope you've enjoyed the music and we'll be back to do it again. We'll celebrate Thursday, hopefully in the sunshine tomorrow. The weatherman says nice things are gonna happen tomorrow. Of course, he's been saying that for two weeks now. Well, we'll be around tomorrow to help you through the day no matter what between 5 and 10. Have a good day. Stay tuned for the news. Charles Templeton, Pierre Burton, and Ned Conlon sitting in for our Pat Murray at quarter past. See you tomorrow. Thank you, John. Appreciate it. Good morning. And you thought working in the morning was easy. We'll be back with more sad tales and happy thoughts in just a moment. This week in TV Guide, a look at a seven-foot television set that isn't for everybody. TV Guide. Quite a view. I'm Rob Parker, host of 24 Hours, the news show on CBLT. Every Monday through Friday at 6.30, Bruce Rogers, Bill Lawrence, Brian Williams, and I bring you a full hour of information. News, sports, weather, special reports, analysis, solid journalism on the world and the community around you. Join us. 24 hours on CBLT, 6.30, Monday through Friday. Tommy Hunter and the gang celebrate their last show of 1974 with top entertainment on the Tommy Hunter Show tonight. Joining Tommy is special guest Mel Tillis, one of today's hottest hit makers in country music. Join Tommy Hunter and the gang for the Tommy Hunter Show tonight at 9. <laughs> You know, one of the big problems in the game today is that the kids, when they get playing it, they just go straight ahead all the time. 
None of the kids today know how to really use their legs to skate properly. Look, you start with a group of youngsters, you teach them how to skate. Then you teach them how to handle the puck and then to give and take a pass. Then you go on to checking. That's where it all starts. Gordon, my son, hang on. It's a boy. You know what I want you to do? You go get your big brother and... How we make your hockey school. Getting down to hockey basics. Watch Howie Meeker Hockey School on CBC Television. Hello, boy. Hurry up. If I can do something with him, the system's perfect. Watch Howie Meeker Hockey School tonight at 7.30. These uh, men of the morning, I suppose, work about 180 degrees off from where most people work. Get up very early in the morning. And the newest member of the uh, morning society, I guess, is Harry. You've only been at this thing for a couple of weeks. Yeah. How do you like it? It's a completely different world out there. First of all, there's no traffic. You don't have a problem parking your car, which is the only fringe benefit that the whole thing has. Okay, what? These hours now, getting up, what time do you start? Well, I get up at 4. Right. And I'm on the road by 4.30. It takes so it, me 30 minutes to drive in, so I, I get there at 5, and, and I go on the air at 6. By 7 o'clock at night, it's time to say goodnight to everyone, right. isn't it? Eh? So yeah. what's this done to your family and social life sort of thing? Well, I see the kids more than I did before, I, because I was doing a public affairs show on radio, which went on the air at 6.30 through to 8 o'clock, as it happens <laughs> on CBC Radio. So I didn't get home until 8.30 or 9, mm -hmm. and spend maybe half an hour with them. But I'd now like I've to got say one thing, Harry. You're making a hell of a mistake just turning up at 5 when you yeah, don't start at 6. Bad. When is this? <laughs> <laughs> Out. You want to take notes? There's some very profes professional advice coming in here. Wally, you've yeah. been at it quite a while. Yeah, a couple What's of years here and there, but, uh, you know, like, my show starts at uh, 5.35, and I've told the news guy, don't fire till you see the whites of my eyes, you know, till you see me coming in the door, even if they're red. <laughs> the eyes, that is. Uh, but, uh, so these guys, they keep talking, they give... You know, the weather for a Mimi and the THL hockey <laughs> scores. <laughs> guy goes on and finally you stagger in, you know. Okay, but, but what's uh, this done to your, your social life sort of thing? It's been beautiful. How's your <laughs> It's good. <laughs> do, you, do you cat nap in the afternoon you're or something like me? that? Yes. No, well, not unless I have to. I mean, there really are very few nights, are there, that, you're, <laughs> that you are up, say, at midnight? Is that a very late? Is that a special night for you if you're midnight? Or can you manage no, to I, cram a couple of hours in here and there? I don't require too much sleep. I don't know about the rest of the guys, but I uh, I can get by on about four or five hours sleep. And I think your 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 whole body becomes tuned to this. Now I think Bob has to. You grab a sleep. Well, he's dozed off yeah, right I, here now. I think. Yeah, no, I, I don't. I uh, no, I, I keep going, afternoon. but I can I can store it up. For instance, I might uh, collapse on a weekend and go to bed if I'm not traveling somewhere, and I'll sleep mm -hmm. for maybe ten, twelve hours. But that is an unbelievable sleep for me. Four or five hours is all I can take. Bob. Oh, oh, I'm, I'm sorry to wake you. <laughs> this is my nap time. I I'm to, sorry. Uh, I'll go over and talk to Jay. How do you swing it, Jay? I don't know. I I found that it uh, it disrupts your social life a bit. If unless you, the people who you in the circle you travel around and understand, like uh, Bob said in the afternoon, he has a nap. I try to, but I do a lot of. Uh, a, a lot of outside work outside the station. Like what? Well, like uh, commercials and stuff. Keith, don't get personal. No, mm -hmm. Keith does a lot of commercials too, and they always <laughs> seem to book uh, the studio for three thirty in the afternoon, oh, yeah. right? So your whole day is busted. So you're, the, you are not finished at ten o'clock. That's not nine the end of your work day, day or nine o'clock or ten o'clock. No, my my day think. actually just starts. In, it starts then, and I write with a fellow, and we're writing a situation comedy right now, and. Uh, I don't know if you've ever done that, but boy, it takes. There's a lot of work writing all that dialogue and the jokes and the visual stuff in there, and, and it's. Uh, what makes you go? What gives you the energy to do this sort of thing? Money, lawyers, <laughs> you name it. <laughs> Keith, when do you get time to get on the farm? I, uh, I, I, I snooze in the afternoon. I think that's very civilized anyway, having mm -hmm. a snooze in the afternoon, and um, I don't have the energy that Wally has. I guess I need lots well, of sleep, or at least a fair amount of it. But I got four teenagers, you know, in the house, and. Mm -hmm. You know what it's like till 11 or 12 o'clock at night with four teenagers around, so you can't get to bed early. There's no way. The radios are blaring, the hi-fi, you know, the friends are coming in. We run a drop-in center out there anyway. At Doc's okay, you're all very well known. Celebrity, right? And I'm wondering if this is an asset or a kind of a liability, because there's a great temptation here to get on to this celebrity circuit. You get all kind of freebies, you can be out every night of the week, people are attracted to you. How do you handle it? Uh, Don't go. <laughs> I, don't, I go to very few of the of the invites, the cocktail parties, for one reason. I think that a lot of the public relations companies, let's face it, these guys, they throw the booze around, they give you a, a sandwich, and they expect yeah. you to give them a plug in return. Well, okay. uh, if they want to buy advertising, I think, you know, uh, that they have to go through the regular channels. I think if, if you have a sponsor on the air and he wants to take out and show you his product on a more personal basis or his service, that's fine. But 
to just have a cocktail party and invite a bunch of guys in, and obviously we're supposed to go out and give them free plugs the next day, and mm -hmm. this I don't go for. Yeah, and then there's the same people, Wally. If you remember, we did the circuit for a while, Wally and I were like uh, Palmer and Nicholas of the cocktail party right. circuit. Mm -hmm. But we did it for a while, and I think one day we had a conversation over a beer and said, you know, these people, are they're all the same people. Yep. And how, how can you go to a cocktail party on Tuesday night, and then on Wednesday night you go to another one and, and somebody's there? And besides that, Bob will bear me out in this. You'll be dead mm -hmm. at the end of besides two weeks. Get into a lot of trouble. Yeah. Are you expected okay. to be very high livers sort of thing? Do people expect this in a restaurant? Do they expect you to tip perhaps more than anyone else? Do they say, no, that's not the suit for you, Ollie? We have some dandies in the back that are twice the price. No, I don't think so. Do I, I, that sort I don't of run into that myself. I don't we don't have a restaurant in Gormley. I don't <laughs> 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 same in Stouffville. Yeah, right. It's the same problem. All right. I'm a big hit as a Stouffville salesman. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Pretty well the same place all the time. Uh, yeah, I, maybe two or three places I go to. I don't go to a lot of different restaurants. Yeah, and I think, too, that, that, uh, that most most places you go to uh, kind of uh, kind of like to have you around, and they'll they'll give you a couple of free drinks or something and figure, boy, he's, you know, he'll... You, you attract you know, people? Attract people, yeah. Mm -hmm. They expect, yeah, they do. They expect too much from you, I think. Mm -hmm. And uh, also at those parties, I think they think you're supposed to be on. Mm -hmm. If you go, yeah. if you take a drink and stand in the corner, somebody invariably comes over and says, what's wrong? Uh, well, yeah. nothing's wrong. I'm just having a drink. How private is your, is your private life? Very. <clears throat> like you, when you leave and get out of this crowd, that's it. You shut them away. Your Pretty audience, much, as yeah. it were. Pretty tough yeah. in Toronto, but down in Stouffville and Grumley, I guess. Yeah. Maybe. Yeah, yeah, no problem. You're kind of shut away there anyway, sort of, aren't you? Now, yeah. this is really a, a, a pressure position, I think, that you are in, because the whole station's day is sitting on top of what you gather, your audience, right? Mm -hmm. So it's a pretty kind of pressure position. Uh, and yet I'm wondering, in a way, if it's not the easiest time of the day, because how receptive are people? They've just gotten up. Everything's kind of right in the day. No one's dinged their fender. They're feeling pretty good. You, you don't to have to work them too hard. Okay. Yeah. This is, I'm interested in, in the people that listen to you. Can you kind of be a little more mm, laissez-faire kind of in the morning than as if you were doing maybe the, the driving home show in the afternoon where they're kind of fired up and they take mm -hmm. exception mm -hmm. to things you say? Well, I think they take exception, too, to a lot of things that we say. But the one thing I find is that I think the all-night guy and the early morning guy has a very personal in thing with the people. I mean, you get the guy before he becomes the president of the bank or before he becomes driver, a truck driver, and you get them all running around in their underwear and mm -hmm. uh, the girls sitting on the side of the bed scratching in the morning. Yeah. And it's a very personal kind of a thing. How that do you know happen. that there's a girl sitting? I think I have reverse of it. I can see what's <laughs> happening. you got a better place. microphone than I have. Pull the stop and go from west of Kipling to the monument where the construction is. I'll be over the Spadina Expressway again in just a minute. And now back to the studio. Good morning. This is Wally Crutter welcoming you back to music. What a change from yesterday, eh? It's now 12 minutes after 8 o'clock, and yesterday at this time it was 51 degrees, and this morning, well, you've heard Jack, it's uh, 17, but it is going to be sunny. Don't want them to think we work too hard at this show. <laughs> As a matter of fact, Matter of fact, the boss always wanted to think that we were here practicing since about 3.30, doing dry runs, you know? Now, do they get involved with you, these people, to the extent that um, they see you as some sort of a confidence, some, an advisor? Well, yeah, on, on top of that, they'll come up, you talk about uh, meeting people. I remember being out at the racetrack one night, and a guy came up to me, and he says, you're Wally Crowder. And I said, yeah. He says, hey, we listen to you every morning. This guy had some racehorses. Mm -hmm. Listen to you every morning in the barn, and I said, thank you very much. And, you know, you keep on eating and having a drink and so on. And the guy comes over and says, uh, I told you, I listen to you every day, and I said, yeah, I really appreciate that. Thank you very much. <laughs> before I know it, the guy's mad at me, because I am not really turned on by this guy listening to me. And he, uh, before the end of the night, said, we're in an argument for no reason, because this guy... He was, knows you personally. That's right. <laughs> really. This is true. You can get he, too close yeah, to oh, people. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, he knows you personally, you're his friend, and he's quite right. insulted that you don't know him. That's right. I like really to get in happens. a place and get out, yeah. because yeah. invariably, particularly if there's any booze around, the guy listens to me, he loves you, but then he finds some fault, and the more Starts blues he has, he's going to start telling you. <laughs> so then, you know, I like to get out before this happens. It's a know. great habit, you know, listening uh, to, to a radio. I suppose it's a television, too, but particularly with radio, and particularly in the morning, I think. Mm. And that's one of the problems we've got with that fellow sitting over there. But I've opened uh, by mentioning the lady who did our makeup. Eh? She, she listens to me because she started listening to me because that was the only station her set could pick up. But it's a habit now. She doesn't listen anymore. Okay, else. then we get these ratings that come along. And what can you do to start moving people? If you want to... Just hang in there. It's about yeah, the what, thing. No, but what, what can you do? How do you 
influence people. If you want to steal some of Wally's audience, how can you go about that? Well, I mean, go to the racetrack, buy them a couple of drinks, <laughs> and let them know. <laughs> Don't get in the <laughs> That's all. <laughs> what happens uh, be while the records are playing? What do you do? I'm probably giving hell to my operator or asking them what's happening next or... Uh, I don't know, we talk back and forth sometimes on the phone. I try not to take phone calls when I'm on the air because I find them sometimes distracting. I guess you fellows go through the same thing. You play a record and you get a call. The guy says, if you ever play that again, I'm never going to listen. Mm -hmm. The next call is, what was the name of that? Where can I buy it? <laughs> the same when you open your mail. You See, can't please them all. I think, yeah. again, that most people think that this is all a very soft touch, that that's what you do. You say, here it is, and then you kind of doze off or read the morning paper or something. Oh, I don't think and you it's can more do that. What sort of preparation do you put into your work, Bob? Oh, I um, usually uh, get to work about a half an hour before airtime, and I zap through the papers. Um, like you haven't done anything, really, up until that point, as far as getting Only 25 ready. years in the business of yeah. preparation, okay. that's about <laughs> all. Yeah. No, I, I scan the morning papers, and uh, that's about it. I pick my music, on, and I now it's operated. I do all my own operating, too, so it's uh, the old one-armed paper hanger thing there. It's very, very busy in the morning contests and the whole number. That girl, you know, she was born in poverty in the Kentucky Hills and just pulled herself up by her brushed bootstraps and made a big success in Tennessee. She just did, started out her career as a cymbal player in an all-girls topless marching band. Do you believe that? That's what she was doing right up until the accident. It's uh, eight minutes past eight o'clock now at CFGM. You're in tune with the Bob McAdory Show. Well, I play one march at uh, five minutes after six. I used to do two a day, and we have a period of inspiration every day. Uh, I lead it, incidentally. Is there? <laughs> yeah, I figure I'd, I need it more than anybody, first of all. <laughs> Lay but a little inspiration this, on us here. This, yeah, this, this started uh, years and years ago on CFRB that we used to play a hymn every morning. One was on at five minutes to six, and one at five minutes to seven. And we got to the point that we were playing the same hymns over and I mean, I, I knew them all off by heart. I used to sing along. It was beauty because I was a choir boy and I knew it was all happening. But this, uh, this business got to the point of where it was a real drag. We're playing the same thing over and over again. So I decided on my own to take it off. I took it off and the telephone calls and the letters we got, and that's the only time the station ever came to me and said, do it again, put it back on or something. I mean, it was a directive from management that they had so many complaints. How much importance do you place upon phone calls, letters? Do they really change the way your well, program is, the things you say? I wouldn't, I wouldn't think they changed. I, I went on the other day on a, on a radar thing. I thought that uh, it was a bad scene to me. I, uh, I got nailed in a back street for 34 miles an hour, and around the corner there was an accident and so on. And I thought that that officer would have been better over there where the kids were coming out of school and sitting on a back street. So I mentioned it on the air. And, of course, I get calls from all the top wheels in the police department. I'm on the fair. And I said, well, what happens about the times that, you know, I come on, I talked a couple of weeks before about... Uh, a lady whose husband died, and she wanted to thank a policeman who stayed with her until uh, her son arrived. And I said, I mentioned that, and I said, you guys uh, never called to say thank you, but if I criticize you. <clears throat> so then a fellow called me after, and he said, you know, he said, I really think that you did the wrong thing in taking a shot at the police department. And I thought about it all day long. And the next morning, I went on the air, and I said, uh, I guess the cops do have a tough time with the... Uh, with the public, you know, the general reaction is that everybody hates a cop when they don't really, and they, they have a hell of a tough job. And this was one <coughs> isolated incident, and I took a shot at him. So I said, uh, I would like to apologize to the yeah. police department. Nobody told me to, but just, now this listener affected me. It bothered me all day yeah, long. I wasn't thinking in terms directly of, of something you might have said, but like the fellow that said, play that again, and I'm never listening. Yeah. If you got half a dozen letters like that, what sort of, you know, weight would that carry with you? Would you really take that letter off? Like, I suppose what I'm asking is, when people ask you to do something, how do you respond to them? Do they really carry any weight if they phone any of you fellas or call any of you fellas? Well, I have a letter here. stayed in bed. Yeah. <laughs> well, I, mean, I, have, I have a letter here. Just happened to bring like one with you. Yeah, yeah. Uh, this is not the original copy. The original copy was sent overseas. I'll just read it to you. But now, I don't know whether this had any influence on my show or not. But it said, Dear Mr. Crowder, I was so pleased to hear you defend the Team Canada when all those so-called smart guys in press and radio said they didn't have a chance. As far as I'm concerned, they can go and themselves. And it's on yours truly, and I'm not going to mention the guy's name, RR1 Milton. Now, this is the ad. He says, P.S., you can read this letter on the air, but please don't use my name. Now, it's, 
It's all right for me to get hell for saying that on the air. That beautiful word. Is he but, pretty typical of, yeah. of your viewer? He, his wife uh, doesn't know this guy listener? swears, you see. <laughs> I, I sent this letter over to Billy Harris to put up on the team wall, and the guy said, we'll put it up because it might be an inspiration. There are a lot of people behind them hoping they win this series. Here's one little guy, obviously a very frustrated little guy out there in a barn in Milton. And... Uh, He's getting the hell of a charge out of this. He's still waiting for me to read it. <laughs> I, uh, I may have to go to management before I put this one on. It's all right on CBC and get away with anything. <laughs> That's what I, do. I, I, I sometimes think in this business we're in, especially in the morning and maybe in the drive time in the afternoon, that you can get on the air and you could say hello and you're going to offend somebody. Oh, you, you just offended me. Yes, yeah, see what I mean? <laughs> you can. You, you know... You can you can give a you can give a weather forecast. Read the actual forecast from the meteorology department mm -hmm. at the at Toronto, at Malton, and and it somebody won't like it. Somebody will say that's a terrible forecast, and they'll get angry at you. Do you get so blamed for the weather? You, you oh, get all, the time. For the weather all the time. All the time. So, you you're the guy that made it snow. Yeah, they yeah, blame right, you. Go, yeah. You go to a golf tournament, you know, and the guy says. Uh, Hey, you said it was going to be sunny and it's raining. I'm sorry, I don't make the weather. I only report it. But, <laughs> right. you know, I'm sure you run into this all the time. The other thing I like is it was when they call the station and say, uh, you know, you'll say uh, sunny. The, well, you know this, Bill. Mm -hmm. yeah. Say uh, sunny this morning with rain uh, this afternoon. Guy will call, what time is it going to rain? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> about a quarter to. You know, I look at the watch, you know, I said, I'd say about a quarter to four, probably. Well, yeah, but start you, coming down. You yeah. keep talking to God like this. And they you're, <laughs> yeah, you're gonna no, I'm that. plugging the book, yeah. But you give a bad forecast for the, all the resort areas to the north, all the ski country people up there are having a bad year. They always are, right? And you'll say it's going to be a high of 50 today. This is in late January or something. And they're phoning up and saying, don't publicize the weather, you know? Yeah. yeah. Don't get off our backs, you know? Yeah, yeah isn't that something? But you have Anyone ever come after you, Wally? Yeah. <laughs> One guy Did you get away? Think, yeah, I, I, I think I've told the story before, but uh, I used to get these calls and letters and everything, and I ignored them. And then one Christmas morning, I was all by myself in the studio, and the queen had just finished her address, and I made a station break. I had, I had one fellow in the master control, and I, I sensed somebody behind me in the... Uh, Keith, you remember the old studios up there on Bloor? Yeah, yeah. We had a big uh, window facing the lobby, and uh, they had three panes of glass and vacuum and uh, I sent somebody behind me but didn't think too much of it and I got up out of my chair and as I got up out of my chair there was a hell of an explosion just bang there's glass everywhere in my arms and back of my neck and and the, the steel or at least the chrome arms of the chair are all pulverized with this glass and I didn't know what had happened and I saw this great big Porsche lamp stand that was in the lobby outside was now sitting in my chair where I had been so I rushed out into the hall and uh, I heard the front door slam, and I rushed downstairs, and here's a guy standing there, and he said, it was me, what are you going to do about it? Well, you know, the guy's got his hands in his pocket. I don't know whether he's got a knife or a gun or what. So I went back upstairs, and I told the kid who was on the, the board at the time, I said, go across the road. And I said, follow this guy wherever he goes. And I said, I'll get the cops here, and I'll wait for them down here. We had, a, meanwhile, a tape on. So they caught the guy anyway, and I had to go down and uh, the next day, and, of course, they, they put the guy away. And uh, about... Two or three years later, uh, the switchboard operator called me one night. She said, there was a fellow in here who wanted to know what time you get here in the morning. And I said, 6.30. And uh, where do you park your car out there? Where do you live? Told him where I lived. And uh, the guy showed her some burns he had in his arms. And he said, he caused this, and I'm going to kill the." Mm -hmm. So uh, uh, she said, I don't know. Just, he sounded kind of funny. Would you know who it is? And immediately, I go back to this guy. So I called. At that time, Chief Chisholm was alive. And I called the chief, and I said, the, this guy wouldn't happen to escape, and he said, I'll call you back. And he called back and he said, yeah, he escaped, and all he's been talking about is getting you. And so uh, I had police protection at my apartment. I had police escort to work. I had a policeman outside of my studio for about three weeks before they finally caught the guy. We'll be back with Toronto's radio men, the men of the morning, after these messages. I, yeah, I've had uh, a lady in Buffalo... When I was doing the Jungle Jay show down, show down there, I was doing also tele, uh, radio, morning radio. And I come into the parking lot at WKBW with the uh, station, Channel 7, is in the same parking lot, you know, mm -hmm. as radio. And I was coming through to go into the studio, and I had my keys out. And it was about 5 o'clock on a February morning, just freezing cold outside. Precinct 6 was right next door to WKBW. And I saw this old DeSoto in the parking lot three kids in it crying and this lady getting out in a spring coat frazzled looking hair she must have been about 49 50 years old and she said excuse me are you 
at the time, Jungle Jay, and I said, uh, yes, ma'am, uh, I didn't mind signing an autograph in the afternoon after television, but you never sign them at 5 o'clock in the morning in the parking lot. Mm -hmm. Then I knew something was wrong. Mm. And she says, uh, you're ruining my marriage, and she pulls out a steel blue 32. And I looked at her, and I thought, key, work this time. You know when ever anybody's after you, your key doesn't work, or you're trying to mm -hmm. get in your apartment, or your key is going yeah. like this, and I start banging on the thing. And she shot, and uh, it, the bullet, I had a winter coat on, a heavy winter coat, went through the coat and just nicked my skin. But it felt like a pinch. And I felt my arm go down by my side and get all warm and numb. And uh, finally, the newsman came to the door and Doesn't this show a barrel of laughs. Eh? Yeah, yeah, I'm having a good really, time. Yeah. <laughs> I get inside the door. I get inside the door, and she's still doing a number. Now this time, the shots are ricocheting, and the police are over by this time. But she was a mayor, a mayor's wife of a very large local. I won't mention the city around Buffalo. She had been in a mental institution. She got out three weeks prior to let it, trying to put me away, and every day at 4:30. They would turn, the, the mayor would come home and turn on my show and not pay any attention to her. I was the reason that her marriage was going down the tube. Mm -hmm. So I had to go. And that's the way uh, her mind yeah. worked. These are kind of the people who don't like you. And I'm wondering if it swings the other way if you come in contact with people who like you too much. I like have that trouble with you the, kind of super, yeah. super studs to a. I've got a big pair of hobnail boots. I just kick them away now. They come by the parking lot. I get these heavy breeders on the phone, and you know they like you a lot. Yeah. What do you do with them? <laughs> I you never had that problem or his problem. I don't know <laughs> what kind of people you got listening. Well, that is a very real problem. Yeah. I'm kind of insulated yeah, from it all. But that's a very real problem. I it had is. that uh, more at Chum. You remember some of the weirdos who'd go out to the parking lot? They're They'd still around. Be hanging from the They're drain still pipes, around, Bob. and they'd leap yeah. on you. You know. Now, what, this is when you're a night man or a morning man? Uh, no, I was in the, uh, doing afternoon drive at Chum. Okay, but what happens um, in the morning? Are there people still up looking oh, for sure. you? Oh, sure. Oh, yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah. yeah. They're a real, that's a serious problem. And I mean, you they wind up in front of this. for you? Oh, well, no. They, they want the body. You're talking about yeah. women. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> there, are, there are a certain group of people. I mean, groupies are not, because I think after you get by a certain age, they lose that. There's a certain group of women, and I think Wally will bear me out on this, who, to them, you're a voice on the radio. No, you're a voice on the radio. And uh, they kind of fall in love with your voice, not you particularly, but they think there is a, a chance for romance. Never ever rains in Southern California. Albert Hammond on show with Jay Nelson. Good morning. Just getting up, are you? Well, it's 816 already. It's going to be cloudy today with some snow flurries. That goes for tomorrow, too. We get a chance of some snow tonight. You know what I think is exciting and interesting? World trade. Like, well, now in Poland, they've got Coca-Cola, and the, the United States uh, got an agreement with Russia. They give them Pepsi, and the Russians are giving the United States natural gas. Think about that. All through the day. I get a letter from one person, I would say, once a month. This has been going on for 10 years. And... Uh, Finally, last week, uh, was I going to come and talk with her and make an honest woman out of her? And I, I don't know who she is, you know, but I, I recognize the writing and yeah. I get this letter. But this woman is, is having a, a mental love affair and it's been going on for years. They're I'm just sure poor, the sick people. They really are. They yeah. need help. It's obvious from reading their mails, but they're still an incredible pain in and they're really scary sometimes, too. <laughs> yeah. The worst <laughs> everyday mail, flowers, candy. Yeah, yeah. I'm you, There's so. one lady that used to send, I bet, uh, maybe she's watching, I don't know, but she used to send to, to me, she used to send me bags of vegetables, fresh vegetables, huge bags. A cab would drop them off. One day, I received, by cab, six of these, you know, these beautiful coffee urns, the silver ones, mm -hmm. you buy them in Simpsons or Eaton's or the Bay or something, but they're this big, you know, the ones you see in boardrooms? Yeah. Six of them, Merry Christmas. Mm -hmm. What do you, you know who you know who they're from? No, I called Simpsons and I it was on her charge. I told I told the girl who I was and I explained it. She is 62 years old. <laughs> That'll tell you something about me. She's 62 years old and uh, a wee bit daft. But let her keep bringing the vegetables. That I can yeah, I, I can do, but get, I can't. Did you keep the things? No, no, I sent them back. Sent them back. I used to get cookies and cakes all the time for one particular that. person. Uh, a lot of them do that and. Uh, I used to worry a lot about the cookies. So I'd take them out and let the switchboard operator eat one, and if she's all right, I'd go yeah. out and finish it. You know? <laughs> <That's>, <laughs> you know, the only way. The only way. <laughs> In a way, yeah, we're almost portraying the morning audience as being, you know, all really down, at, down a quart yeah. and about nine cents short no, of a dime. I, that was going to be my very next point. We're talking about 1%. The right. other 99% right. are not only beautiful, 
but when you do hear from them not via phone or letter, you just never uh, are, you cease to be amazed at their reaction or their warmth or the communication yeah. you have with them. They're just beautiful. I mean, that's, that's why we're doing it. Yeah, really. so that's there, a one percent. Yeah, yeah, it's just the one percent. Is there nuts, perhaps one right. incident that kind of made getting up as early as you do all worthwhile? Maybe on just one day or over a period of time. Perhaps you helped someone or got involved or something like that. Because I think most of the contact that we have with people is usually of a negative variety, is it not? They're usually chipping at you for something, right? Yeah, well, some right. people, yeah. Okay. So is there perhaps one instance that made you kind of feel well, warm all over and kind of proud to be a part of this morning scene? Uh, there are probably many of them. I, I remember one time we had a personal tragedy in my family and I was back at work a few weeks. My mother said, how can you do that? How can you go in there and sound happy and do jokes. What, how can you possibly do it? And I thought about it, and it did seem a little weird, but I said, the, you know, the answer is that there's so many people out there who are in bigger trouble, who really are lonely, and you really mean something to these people. You can get their whole head turned around the right way at the beginning of a day, eh? You just get them thinking positively and thinking good. And uh, that's, the, that's the really important part. But there are all kinds of instances, you know. One, I got a letter not long ago from a lady who, uh, whose husband was uh, dying, and uh, he just got the biggest charge in the world out of the uh, morning show. And he mm. listened and uh, laughed every morning and identified with it very much. And she just wrote to thank me, you know, and that, that really grabbed me. You can't me. really all touching. go on till you're 70 or 65 doing what you do. <clears throat> Why? I don't think so. Well, he's done it. Can you? Sure. Yeah. I didn't know that. Tell us your secret, Wally. I thought people I, uh, you I moved on it. to do things. No, I enjoy it. I have... Uh, so where do you go? I have set a, a target date for retirement right now. Announced it to the station. This is based on what? Just time or when you've put uh, kind of enough away? We have, we have a number of years. And I said that I wanted to walk away here. To what? I don't know what I want to do. I might not go, but at the same time, I would hate to be in a position of, of uh, not being needed. Or maybe I don't want to work anymore. You know, you, you reach you, that stage of but life. But you really don't know what you want to go on to. Just no, I don't know. I might, okay. uh, I, I'd, like to be in, I'd like to be involved in sports again. That's always, I've always been a frustrated sports Barry, coaster. after two weeks... Uh... Well, and because I'm the youngest, mm -hmm. um, <laughs> I, I don't know, with the gun and the cabbages and, and the guy with the, <laughs> Maybe the I, I'd like to get my day job back now. <laughs> <laughs> or get back to medicine. Uh, yeah. <laughs> you could uh, look after these fellas. And Bob? Yeah, I know definitely what I want. Uh, when my kids are growing up, I'm going to sell my farm and I'm going to move to Ireland and buy a hotel in Cork. That's a nice, quiet place right. to be. Jay? I'm going to be Bob's bartender at that hotel in Cork. <laughs> no, I think what I'm going to do is I want to get into television production more, and, and the, I'm in the writing end of it now, and, uh, and uh, maybe uh, d uh, direct a film. I just finished producing and directing a, a, my first film commercial, mm -hmm. and it was quite, quite enjoyable, and that's what I want to do. Okay. And, and I'm you've just got gonna, the farming. I'm going to keep on doing what I'm doing, which is farming. Yeah. Well, all of you keep on doing what you do so well. Wake us all up in the morning. And uh, I guess it's kind of bedtime now. We're sorry to have kept you up this late. So See you later. We thank Keith Rich and Jay Nelson and uh, Harry Brown, Bob McAdory, and Wally Crowder. Concentration in Australia really work. It works on occasions. Well, it doesn't seem to. A fisherman requires strength and skill and courage, and you just wonder where the fishermen are going to come from for our own grand banks. Most of the people in it are getting older. The younger ones don't want to step forward. Who is going to fish for our fish? Things in the air have changed. In a lot of cases, they're changes for the better. Heyday, a forum for presenting relevant and topical labor issues. Watch Payday Sunday afternoon at 4.